Well, good morning, and thank you for checking us out today at that Cumberland County Community Church. And it is an unusual time, but it's a time where we believe God will bless and encourage each one of us as we move forward in our faith. And so I encourage you to listen up as we hear more about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that we're talking about Jesus, no ordinary man. And uh, that's a wonderful thing. We talked about his birth, how magnificent it was. And we saw that he was not only fully man, but fully God. He was the God-man. And then we talked about his miracles. And, and he did miracles for a purpose. Those miracles were to identify him as the promised one that would come, the deliverer of Israel, the one who would die for the sins of mankind, the very Son of God, the God-man. And he did all these wonderful miracles so that some would be able to respond. Some wouldn't. They'd have hard hearts. They wouldn't, want, they wouldn't believe even what, though they saw it, and, and uh, yet they wouldn't embrace Christ, but some would. And for those that believed, they received eternal life, for they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we're going to talk about his demands. Now this is an important thought to think about. If Jesus is the God-man, he has the right to control our lives, to rule our lives. And that's an important thing to understand. He makes demands on the lives of those who claim to be his followers. And that's what we want to look at today. And as people were watching his miracles, they approached him. They, they said, oh, what do I have to do to be your disciple? How can I follow you? And they were very uh, anxious to do that. But then Jesus was very, very careful to lay demands upon them so they understood that following him had a cost. Here's the first thing. He demanded that we count the cost of following him. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this seems a little contradictory at first when we hear that hating your father and your mother because after all, it's not Christianity about loving one another? And the answer is yes, it is. But here's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about contrast. Let me give you a picture of how this works. Let's say that we were in a country where Christianity was outlawed. And if you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you could lose your job, you could lose your livelihood, you wouldn't be able to support your family. And so then what would happen is you confess Christ, you lose your job, and then the authorities come and they say, look, if you would denounce Christ and return back to this faith that you had before, we will give you your job back. And you say, no, I can't, I can't, he's my savior, I can't deny him. And then, then they say, but you will lose everything. And then the wife cries out, don't you love us? Don't you love the children? And the answer is, yes, yes, but I cannot deny Jesus. And that's what Christ is talking about here. No, so he says in verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's pretty strong. He didn't say, may not be. He said, cannot be my disciple. Then he puts a, a little story here. Which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost? And so, you know, in Christianity, we're so anxious for people to make a decision for Christ. But sometimes we need to be clear that Christ is going to make demands on the life. Which one does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him. And I've seen so many people sort of start off at the Christian life, but the minute a difficulty comes in, they're gone. He says, count the cost. And so they mock and they say, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And so Jesus makes a very strong demand on our life that we, that we give him our all, that we follow him with everything we had. Notice another passage in Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. It says, when Jesus saw a crowd was around him, of course, everybody loved the miracles and what he was doing, and saw a crowd gathers around, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And it says in verse 19, and a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, I want to give that scribe some credit. 
He was a Jewish scribe. Many of the Jewish leaders were rejecting Christ. They were threatened that they would lose their positions. And here's this scribe who takes a bold move. He said, I will follow you. But notice what Jesus said to him in verse 20. He said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now the man was sincere. He, was a, he took a risk just reaching out to Jesus and, and what he did. But Jesus did not want him to misunderstand the commitment. And Jesus wanted him to be totally committed. He wanted to cause the man to realize that it wasn't just about miracles he had seen, but it was identification with the mission and the purposes of the Lord. The miracles identified Jesus as sent from God, the God-man, and that, that was clear. We see that in John chapter 3. Remember Nicodemus, it says there was a man, he was a Pharisee, he was a religious leader, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. But notice, this man came to Jesus by night. He didn't want to catch him by day, he didn't want to be noticed, but he comes by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, how did he know that? Notice, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And the Lord Jesus Christ will make commands on our life and does make commands because he is from God. He is the living God. And, and he makes those demands. He has a right to make those demands on our life. Martin Luther said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. So Jesus demands that we count the cost of following him. But then secondly, Jesus demands that we do not put off serving him. When you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants you to begin to serve. You have become part of his army, part of his group of servants, his disciples. Look what it says in Matthew 8.21. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Now, did you notice this? Let me first. That's the whole reversal of what discipleship is. Discipleship is Jesus first, not let me first. And so when you get that straightened out, you've got that figured out. Let me first go bury my father. Now, the realization is the father was probably not dead at all. What was he really interested in? <clears throat> well, he probably wanted the inheritance. He didn't want to be seen as leaving the Father and losing the inheritance. But Jesus is very forthright on this. Jesus said to him, follow me, and notice this, leave the dead to bury their dead. Now, the, I don't believe the Father was dead, but I believe he was spiritually dead. And he said, don't follow the spiritually dead. Don't hang on to the spiritually dead. You're going to follow me. You're going to get life from me. Get going with me and leave the dead, bury the dead. So, some people say it like this. Oh, I'll serve the Lord. I'll serve the Lord. When I, when I get done in school, that's when I'll serve the Lord. Or, or when I'm done raising my children, that's when I'll serve the Lord. Or when I retire, I've lots of time, that's when I'll serve the Lord. But the Lord says, no, serve me now. Elijah and Elisha, Elijah was a prophet, and about the end of his ministry, God says, I'm going to put another prophet like you. His name was Elisha. And so in 1 Kings 19.19, 19, he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Saphat, who was plowing. Now notice what he was plowing with. Twelve yoke of oxen in front of him. Now what he means is there were different groups doing the plowing and he's behind them. It means that Elisha was very wealthy. We're talking about a time when the nation is in a drought when things aren't growing, how can a man afford so many oxen? He was wealthy. He was a powerful farmer in the community. And so he is plowing. And what happens? It says when he is plowing, Elijah passed by him, cast his cloak upon him. What he is saying is, God has called you to ministry, Elisha. God has called you to take my cloak and my mantle. And he cast it upon him. And so then he left the oxen. He knows what that is. And he runs after Elijah and he says, 
Whoa, let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. And he said, go back again for what have I done to you? Now what he's saying is, you make up your mind. You make up your mind. And so what does this man do? He goes back and, and, and from following him and he, they took the yoke of oxen, he sacrificed them, boiled their flesh, and he gave it to the people and they ate and he probably said something like this, I am leaving God has called me. I am leaving. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. That's the kind of response that God wants us to make when we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Florence Nightingale is very famous, was a nurse, among other things. And here's one of the statements she said. I attribute my success to this. I never gave or took any excuse. I never gave or took an excuse. And so many of us make excuses for why we're not serving God. And God says, I make demands on you. If you claim to be my follower, these are the things I want you to do. The late theologian and philosopher Francis Schaeffer, who I read many of his books and touched my life in many ways, when he was first a new Christian, he shared with his father, and his father was not interested in the gospel. And then he told his father that he wanted to go to college and to become a minister. And his father was totally against it, didn't want him to do that. Well, when the moment finally came where he had to make the decision to go with what he thought God wanted him to, or to submit to his father's wishes, Fran asked in a strained voice, Pop, Give me a few moments to go down in the cellar and pray. So he goes down into his cellar in fear and uncertainty. And he goes down there and he starts weeping tears of sorrow for his father. Then in an act of desperation and simple faith, he pulls a coin out of his pocket. And, he, and I wouldn't advise you to find the will of God this way, but he takes the coin and he says, God, I'm going to flip, me, flip this coin. Oh, God, show me. If the coin is heads, show me that you want me to go. And so in his prayers and his flips, he flips it, and it's heads. And so he's still sort of trembling because he knows his father's going to have this incredible reaction when he says, I, I want to go to school, and I want to be a minister. I want to serve the Lord. And so he's crying and weeping, and he said, God, please be patient with me. And he says, let me do it one more time. Let me flip it again. And if it comes up, tails, oh no, tails. And so he flips it again and it lands and it comes up, tails. Oh, oh, he's, he's really shaken now because he's still a little bit nervous about going upstairs to see his dad one more time. And he says, oh dear God, I, I'm just so scared. Let me do it one more time, Lord, one more time. And if it comes up heads, I'll go. And he flips it one more time, lands, and it comes up heads. And he's weeping, and he says, I know this is what God wants me to do with my life. He wants me to give him my all and to follow him. And so he goes upstairs, and he tells his dad what he's going to do. His dad looks at him hard and walks out towards the door, and it's slamming behind them. But he heard him say as the door was slamming, I'll pay for the first half year. And then Francis Schaeffer says, many years later, he believes that was the day that his father's heart was touched. And even though it took many years for his father to come to Christ, he believes that moment was the basis of his father's salvation. The moment he said, I must Follow the Lord. Jesus makes demands on our lives. He demands that we count the cost of following Him. He demands that we do not put off serving Him. He demands that we see the world as He sees it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. He's doing those wonderful miracles and people are catching on. But notice verse 36, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. For they became for them, on them because they were harassed 
and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I used to, when I was a student at Moody Bible Institute, I used to go to the downtown Chicago and I would sit on the corner of a bridge and I would watch people go by and I would look at their faces and I would say, do you think that person saved? Do you think that person knows Christ as their savior? And I'd see some with a scowl on their face. <laughs> I don't think they could know Jesus. I'd see others who had a sense of joy. I think they could know Jesus. And I would look at them, but I would know that a vast amount of people needed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They should have had shepherds that shepherd after their hearts and that really cared for them. But the nation had become somewhat corrupt and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so the Lord says in Matthew 9, 37, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's a great harvest out there, but the laborers are few. I can't help but think in the time that we're in right now, the harvest is plentiful. People are concerned and they're worried. But here's what they're really thinking about. They're just thinking about where I live or die. And here's a great time for us to say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and Savior. If I live, I live. If I die, I go to live with Him, for I shall never perish. That's the promise of the Word of God. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, he says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. And I believe that God is doing that right now. Sending out laborers into His harvest. What a wonderful opportunity to express your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus makes demands on his life. He demands that we count the cost of following him. He demands that we do not put off serving him. He demands that we see the world as he sees it. And then he demands that we be identified with him. Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. And then he says, it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of the household? Listen, we know when we live for Christ in a broken world, sometimes somebody's going to mock us, make fun of us, they're going to push us away, they're going to they're blame some things on us. We know that. They did it to Jesus. They'll do it to his followers. But we are committed. He demands that we be identified with Him. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. We are not ashamed of Him. We will be identified with Him. Matthew 10, 26, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Listen, a Christian should not be concerned with what the world thinks about Christians, except that we should live a holy and righteous life. But if we are pleasing God, if we are pleasing God, we should go on and press on, as Bill Gothard says, when a man's ways please the Lord, it does not matter who he displeases. And we want to please the Lord. We want to speak up for the Lord. We want to tell people about the salvation provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 27, What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. That's a great time to do that. We're not allowed to go anywhere. We can do some proclaiming. Jesus is my Savior. I'm not living in fear and worry. I am living in confidence and assurance. Don't put your light under a bushel. Now is a great time to shine. And so he says in verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And we need to be aware. We need to be aware that there's nothing that anybody or any disease can really do to us. Our destiny is sure. Our salvation is absolute. The promises of God are yes, and we can count on them. Someone said a feeble, nominal Christianity is the great obstacle to the conversion of the world. Be not ashamed. Shine for Jesus, even in this dark hour. 
And we can't be lost. That's the assurance. We can't go to hell. We can't be lost. We are secure in Christ, and we live with that. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are numbered. This is our God. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So he says this very clearly. So everyone, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But then notice this. This is where you know you're a disciple. He says, but whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's possible that some confess but not possess. If you profess Christ and you, you confess Christ, you need to live under the demands of our Lord. And he makes demands on our life. And so we need to understand, he's not talking about an occasional lapse or struggle. People have that. He's talking about when you live your life consistently in an unfaithful way where you don't share Christ with a broken and fallen world and no one can figure out you're a Christian. Peter had a lapse in faith, but later, later after he again met up with the risen Christ, he lived his life totally to the end for Christ. And disciples ran at the crucifixion, but they all ended up coming back. And when people told him to shut up, they said, no, we can't. We will preach Christ. And that's how it is with the believer. He makes those demands on our life. We count the cost of following him. And then he demands that we do not put off serving him. He demands that we see the world as he sees it, lost and broken. He demands that we be identified with him. And then he demands we give him total allegiance. The Lord does not like lukewarmness. He likes Christians that are sold out. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those in his own household. And sometimes I hear Christians say, you know, I could share Christ with everybody, but with those in my household. They get so upset when I share Jesus. And that's just what Jesus said. Sometimes when you take a stand for Christ, and you haven't been born in a home that is Christian, and, 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 and sometimes your, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father becomes very upset with your commitment. And yet, what do you do? Well, look what it says in verse 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Don't back off on your confession of faith because of a struggle you may have there. And he says, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And he says the same kind of thing again in Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life, okay, I'm going to be quiet. I'm not going to get in any trouble. Nobody's ever going to yell at me for being a Christian. I'm going to hide my light. I'm not going to take any chances. Whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Then he goes on to say, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? We need to know we're all going to die. We're either going to die saved and serving, or we're going to die ashamed and perhaps lost if you haven't given your heart to Christ, if you're not willing to follow Christ. And this is what we need to think about. Verse 26, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jim Elliot said it this way, If we are sheep of his pasture, remember that sheep are headed for the altar. The Lord wants us to learn to die to ourselves and live to him. So he demands that we take up his cross and, and, and follow him. We count the cost. His demand is that we, we don't put off serving him. His demand is that we, we take up the cross, and as we do that, we see the world as he sees it, lost and, and headed for hell. He demands those who take up his cross identify with him in every way, not being ashamed, and he demands that 
those who take up his cross give him total allegiance. And he who refuses to take up their cross, he says, is not worthy of God. Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And I pray that you found it and or are finding it as you put your faith in our incredible Savior, Jesus, no ordinary man, Jesus, the God-man. Jim Elliott again said this, forgive me for being so ordinary while claiming to know so extraordinary a God. Well, let's conclude with this thought. In John chapter 6, verse 66, many of his disciples, after hearing his hard teaching, turned back. And it said, no longer walked with him. So Jesus turns to the twelve, and he says, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter, always willing to speak up. Simon Peter answered him, Lord! To whom shall we go? You have the words of life. That was true then, and that is true today. To whom should you go? Jesus, no ordinary man. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that every one of us would be sold out to Jesus in every single way. He makes demands, and we want to live up to those demands. He also gives us the ability to do it. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He gives us the promises of heaven. He gives us all the assurances we need. Now, Lord, might we be obedient in every way, for we truly worship Jesus, the Son of God, no ordinary man. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you. And God bless you.